really matters. God said to me, a nation needs help. We need to accept that some of the jobs that our fathers are doing, the children also have to support. Anyone that thinks for people is successful. Start to think for your people and everyone will grow. we will not allow it. It has to stop. If you were part of the government, how different would you make it? I am here not to talk to people, but I'm here to listen to you. I am just here to change your mentality because that great mentality will build a great nation. He's here to change our mentality and that would, of course, build a great nation. And this is Nana Kwame Bediako, uh, popularly known as Freedom Jacob Caesar or Cheddar for some people. And it's almost three months since he announced his bid to run as president here in Ghana as an independent candidate. How is it going so far? Well, he recently embarked on his listening tour across all the regions. I want to find out how that is going. And of course, some statements he's made has generated a lot of conversation, but he's here in the studios with us and he will speak to all of that. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm very well, Bella. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we're glad to have you. It must have been a busy couple of weeks because you embarked on your tour, the listening tour. Yeah. How many regions have you visited so far? About eight or nine. Wow. Yeah. In the space of how many weeks? 11 days. 11 days? Yeah, it's been very hectic. I can imagine. Yeah, very now, hectic. now tell me why you dubbed it the listening tour. Well, the listening tour was something that I wanted to do very different from all the other campaigns that have happened in this country, because as you already see, uh, you're seeing that we are not following the traditional political way of campaigning. Mm. You know, we want to do something very different. We want to be able to interact with the people. We want to reach the people. We want to connect with them. We want to know their problems. We want to know how best we can govern them if mm. we had the chance. And so we decided to go out to all the regions. One, to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Two, to do research, to research the mineral spaces, the farming spaces, okay. the potential of all the regions, because our number one policy is industrial, regional industrial revolution, mm. to be able to create economies in all the regions and then consolidate the economies to okay. create an increment and an impact in, in, in the economic prosperity of this mm. country. So we decided to do it that way, and it's been tremendously insightful. I can imagine. So based on the research, I don't know if that has been completed or that's still ongoing we are for all the regions that you visited. We're still, I mean, currently we've realized that 69.8% of the people are just mm. looking for jobs. Mm. You know, from you know the, the, the sort of statistics that we're putting together, the analysis is telling us that um, the regions are lacking jobs. Mm -hmm. And then the season of having something is when campaign kicks off. And that's when they sort of get compensated or yeah. I don't know if you call it bribe, whatever it is. Um, apart from that, it's quite tough for them. There are people who are saying that they have finished either university or they've educated themselves, but mm -hmm. there are no jobs. There are women who are looking after both husband and children, you know, and yeah. they're in their 30s. So it's quite sad out there. Uh, we're in Accra, so we might not be able to see a lot of this and mm. feel it. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people have come back to tell us what's really going down in these areas. But this is just the 16 regional listening tour. We're about to do the 275 
district campaign tour everywhere in Ghana. We want to really see the country. We want to see the problems of the country. And um, not just because we want to become a leader of this country or, or the president of this country or mm -hmm. the government, but it's also because it's in our interest to see how best we can help our country and the people of the mm. country. Now, now, beyond just the about 60% or more who are unemployed, what are some of the things that have shocked you in some of these areas that you have visited? Um, some of the things that have shocked me is the disabled world. Um, their, their industry is um, completely forgotten about, you know. Um, they used to have some jobs when they're towing boots and all of that mm. were there, but, you know, they've lost that as well. And then they're coming to the streets more. But, you know, that's, that's the people who are in Accra. Mm. They get the opportunities to come to the streets to beg. Yeah. And when you go to the regions, they're literally villages and they're supposed to be states, mm -hmm. you know. But I think with the... Uh, with, with the industrial revolution that we want to put in the regions, yeah. it would help such people. And then we have to have them in mind because I've already helped disabled people here to use tricycles to go into Uber businesses and mm. they've employed disabled people. And I, uh, I've studied the South African dis Disability Program, okay. which really is helping the economy, it's helping the people. So that's some of them. The other one which is really touching me, um, you know, it's it's the women of our country, mm. you know, because, you know, I was raised by my mother, so I advocate for women and I have a strong thing for why can't the strength of a woman be demonstrated, you know, mm. within our economy. So I realized that, you know, they're hardworking. Yeah. They, some of them are farmers and their husbands have lost their jobs. So they end up having to Doing cook, work. Yeah. work take care of the children and do everything. And they're really begging that, you know, we should have a change. So, you know, jobs and everything would, um, would, would, would be, you know, apprehended to this sort of people. Mm -hmm. And then through that, they would be able to sort of get a balance in exactly. life that they're looking for. Now, you talk about women, and that brings me to the Affirmative Action Bill, because that's something that, you know, as a country, we've been pushing for a long time. It's still not been passed into law. That has delayed for so long. If you should become president, how soon are you looking at ensuring that the Affirmative Action Bill is passed to ensure that women occupy, you know, equal number of positions and are also treated equally as well, and they get to make decisions just like the men? I mean, three motives for our new force and even our presidential ambition and uh, governmental um, platform that we're building. Mm -hmm. uh, one is equity. Yeah. Two is equality and three is empowerment. And you can see clearly that we're following that trend and that path. I mean, people might not see that that's what we're doing, but trying to create a 16 industrial revolution, meaning that whatever resources that belongs to the country should mm -hmm. be shared adequately to the people. And that is the equity we're talking about, you know, uh, human equity, uh, state equity. People have to get their share. They, If you belong to Eastern region and there is cocoa there, you mm -hmm. know, you have to benefit from the cocoa processing, from all of that. And then equality is making sure that there is fair treatment for all citizens. Yeah. So we care about uh, disabled as much as we care about women mm -hmm. and the youth. You know, we feel like they have taken a lot from these three parts of our country. Mm. Youth, they are robbed of their age and their time. Yeah. So before we realize they're 30, 35, and they're still looking for jobs, mm -hmm. which means they've passed their uh, building their career time. You know, uh, women are mostly kept in the kitchen or they feel like, okay, we're going to give you chop money. And, and we, I feel like we robbed women of their rights. Mm. And um, women contribute equally to this world's um, succession. I believe that if we are able to empower our women, uh, our economy can change drastically. Mm -hmm. Our ways of living can change drastically. And um, I think a man and a woman together, it's paired. It's like a pair of shoes. We're supposed to equally do things and make things better. So I believe in these things. Um, okay. Yeah, I do believe. Well, in 2012, the NDC had promised that they were going to ensure that there was at least 40% uh, representation for women in uh, the late president's government. That didn't happen. The current president had also promised 30% representation. What are you promising? If you're talking about equity, equality, are we looking at a 50-50, um, you know, 
equal share? Is that what you're referring to? Well, Bella, I think that promises are a bad thing in politics. Okay. I mean, the best time for someone to promise you is when they want to marry you. Mm. <laughs> you well, know, even, that. <laughs> even that. Even <laughs> that. Well, as, as long as they invest in the ring first, at least you're guaranteed of something because mm -hmm. then they're exchanging something before they give their promise. You know, when they give you empty promises, then you're waiting for it to be fulfilled. Mm. And a lot of that can go backwards. Now, not to say that people intentionally do that. Sometimes it's circumstances beyond contr their control. Yeah. You know, so a lot of these things, I don't blame some of the government. I think that they just have a template mm. that they use, you know, to convince people just for voting. And then my worries is that, is it about the human beings and the country? or is it about the party and the chair? Well, I'm more about the human beings, okay. the nation building, I'm more about national development, you know, that these things are, I get my buzz from it, you mm. know, and being able to develop things, being able to change things. Uh, I'm a visionary, mm. so I want to be able to make that change, but I don't think I want to come with a promise that because I promise you're scared, all women. You might not be able to. No, I'm not meet scared. I'm not scared at all. I think that promises are bad things when you just keep saying it. Okay. But having a purpose can lead to what people expected from promises. Mm. You know, you just need to have a purpose that I have to do this for women. Okay. I have to do this in my nation. I have to do this in my country. But you're not saying I have to do this for you. Mm -hmm. It's just that generally you believe that it has to be done. That is purpose. Okay. The difference between purpose and promise is huge. You know, politicians like promises. Mm. Leaders like purposes. But you say you're not a politician. I am not. Uh, honestly, because I don't understand politics the way politicians in Ghana understand their template mm. of politics. But I definitely understand leadership, and I think that even if you're a politician, you still need leadership skills mm -hmm. to be able to govern a country. You need a couple of skills, you know, not just leadership skills, mm. but you need, you know, uh, a, a skillability um, command to be able to do things mm. uh, the right way because you're not doing the things for yourself and your family or for your own interest. You're doing things based on what the national or the public are demanding, mm -hmm. are expecting, you know, and so... You don't think they've... they've showcase leadership so far? I wouldn't say they haven't. Okay. It's just that it hasn't gone the way people are expecting it to be because if it had, then we will be known for a booming economy, mm -hmm. uh, a developing country that people appreciate or are talking about. But currently, uh, the Bloombergs and the CNN and the BBC have branded Ghana as, you know, yeah. a crashed economy. Mm -hmm. And inside the country as well, a lot of people are complaining since we started going around that mm. there are no jobs, there are no this and that and that. So even if uh, the, the vacancies was maybe 10%, before, I feel like it's, it's grown times three or four. It's, mm. it's, it's becoming more and more. And it so, needs to be fixed. Yeah, but I, it could be the fact that the constitution of this country has become a template that people are worshipping. Mm. Whereas, you know, they might have good intentions before they become a leader. Yeah. But the party itself m might have its own political agenda which has nothing to do with the country's development, uh, its vision, mm. you know, i.e. somebody will start something and somebody will come and ignore that thing. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to be going forward as a country. We're not supposed to be, um, to be biased mm. <laughs> about who has to do this and who have to do that. And, 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 and I, I think that's where the problem is. So for me, I don't believe in blaming people. I don't believe in excuses. I'm yeah. strictly a non-believer. I believe in finding solutions to problems. So I like action. Well, so governance is, you know, a continuation. Basically, that's what it is. It You're talking be. about a national development plan that we should all follow so that whoever comes into power can still focus on what yes. is needed. By yes. we, we do have that. We do have that, but that has not been followed. Are you saying that if you should be voted into power as president, you're going to go back to that and ensure that whatever was advised to be done then will be done? 
I will not necessarily go back to whatever that is written by mm. them as a national plan because most of these things are cut and paste. You know, it's very well written when you look at some manifestos, you know, mm. a whole lot of promises and this and I'll do this and that and that. But it's one thing to say, it's another thing to do. And it's not as easy to do it than to say it. You know, mm. I would um, have a plan. Okay. Uh, a plan that is suitable within a time frame. Because, you know, these are some of the experiences I've acquired already. Being able to put maybe 108 apartments in a space of three years, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of planning you know, coordinating, communication, construction, development, investing, mm -hmm. and um, even operation. So uh, if you have like a regional plan, yeah. you know, you might not be able to do all the 16, but once you start and seven is kicked off and it's proved to the country that you have created 100,000 jobs per region, which is 700,000 to a million mm -hmm. in total, you would have reduced the deficits a little bit, yeah. you know, and that could be a template for people to continue with. But it, this is not a uh, rocket science, mm. you know, it, it's something that once we're able to um, do that, it, it, it would be difficult for people to want to um, get back or, or, or retract from that. Mm. You know, they, they just want to go forward because, okay. yeah. I see. So, so if that's the case, I want to understand um, a statement that you made while you were on tour. I think this was when you went to the Ashanti region. Yeah. And you talked about the fact that you want to bring the sea or dredge the sea into Kumasi so that you can open up a port there to make um, it easier for the containers to reach there. I'm sure you've seen the reaction to that statement. Yeah. Are you surprised that people are reacting this way? I'm not surprised. I'm actually happy because, you know, I was looking at, like, you know, the national games to be a big thing and mm -hmm. then to have one statement made and it's kind of competing with the whole national games. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great trend, you know, but I have to be able to explain myself to people to understand. Okay. My vision is not to come and um, sort of uh, um, push or encourage people who are traveling out of this country to go and buy things and bring it back to sell. Mm. You know, my vision is to bring industrialization into this country and then after let it become a template that African countries can also replicate just to stabilize our economy. Now, if you're talking about industrialization, yeah. you're going to see that one of the main things that is needed is logistics. Mm. And um, logistically, our country has only roads to deal with. Yeah. When you go to anywhere in the world, Asia, Europe, everywhere, they have railways and they have the water bodies. Yeah. It's called water transportation. You know, you have the ferries, you have the canals. And then besides the canals and the ferries are new cities that are coming up in areas where people are living. Mm. So for me, I looked at um, Ashanti region when I was there, since I do my research in almost every region, and I realized that, you know, maybe 30% of the furniture in this world mm. <laughs> has probably come from Ashanti timber. Yeah. You know, how did they even get it out of that place? They must have been driving a lot of timber locks, uh, tracks, and going up and down. And, and then you're talking of gold. We, we were at some point the second biggest gold producers and uh, I think the most gold comes from that sector. Mm. Uh, you're talking of farming, there's so much. And I, I like reading maps. Okay. So, you know, I've been doing it since I was a kid, since I was 16, I found out that the Atlantic Ocean, the Indiana Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and surrounded Africa. So it makes it like an island mm. as a continent mm -hmm. where I, re I realized that people only cross the water to come to Africa to search for uh, treasures, you know, opportunities. So when I was looking at the map, when I was in Techiman, I discovered that they had river tunnel mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And the river tunnel goes all the way, all the way to the uh, border. Okay, that's the map on, on the screen. Yeah, so you see it. Uh, tunnel is somewhere there and it goes to the end. You see second D is there. Mm -hmm. And then when you come to this end here, you see that's tunnel there. Yeah. And tunnel comes all the way. It's just the sea. <laughs> so okay. you just open it and it's connected. You just dredge it and it's connected. It becomes a pathway. It's been sitting there for hundreds of years. No one has connected it. Mm. Okay, but tunnel leads you to Techiman. Techiman is the biggest cocoa producer in the country. Mm. Where are their cocoa going? And if we're distributing it amongst 10 regions or even within the West African countries, you still need to connect it there. Okay. Now, on the way from Kumasi, to um, Takrade, mm -hmm. uh, you will see uh, a river Pra. 
yeah. and Oti. And you see these two rivers are very close and they connect. There's the Ankroba, uh, Ankroba yeah, River, Ankroba, you see? Yeah. So mm -hmm. they, they, they are all there, but we just haven't dredged to connect them. So when you look at Second D or Cape Coast, look at the Pra. It's uh -huh. connecting to Cape Coast. All that edge that you're seeing there, that black edge, is the sea. So, so that's what you meant by yeah. saying that you were going to bring the sea to Kumasi. Of course. But it's, it was going to go through where? It, or it, where would, exactly? it would take the river bodies. It would take the water bodies. That's what dredging is about. The dredging has to meet mm -hmm. another water. You know, it, it, it's like you are taking debris and you're opening the space so the water can flow. Mm -hmm. And you might cut through a path to extend it. So some of it might have a little breakages, like you see where Pra is. Yes. Pra is coming all the way to Sikandi. Mm -hmm. And you see, if you see Pra, you see that it's crossing through Kumasi. But, but you see, it's not that easy to just connect, especially when we're dealing with Galamse and the fact that most of our river bodies are at the moment in the worst state possible. So have you considered, and that's why a lot of people are asking what the feasibility studies are. Have you looked at all that, looking at ways to clean up our river bodies even before you connect? That is the treasure. That is, that is the investment, mm -hmm. okay? We need to understand one thing. Investment and development is key, mm -hmm. okay? And when I say investment and development, I don't just mean houses or, or businesses. Mm. When the investment we put in our people, the investment we put on our land, it can last us 500 years of returns, mm -hmm. one investment. Now, people have done dredging in 500 BC. There were no excavators. Mm. Hard work. They yeah. moved and the water crossed and they joined. Egypt did it those days. Mm. And today, Egypt is one of the biggest, uh, should I say, strongest economy mm. in, in, in Africa. Because of the Swiss Canal. It, yes, it's, it's connecting. You open your country up. Now, God created all of these things and gave the human, the brain, the, the, the natural things around us for mm. us to decide ourselves how we can expand things, how we can make things work. When the English people were building their underground system, there were no excavators. Mm. They used chisels and hammers to do that. Today, we have a whole lot of excavators and we're just mm. sitting there and throwing littering things into our water and throwing garbage into it, but we're not using it. I am talking about coastal transportation because mm -hmm. the future of Ghana and Africa will be based on industrial revolution and it's about to start. That is us making sure that we manufacture our resources so we don't go out there to buy it again. Because the people who are taking our resources bauxite, mm -hmm. we go back to China to buy aluminum and bring it back after they go and refine it. So I don't want that. I want to be able to introduce industrialization and let our children, let the nation, our country, mm -hmm. learn how to turn the bauxite material to alumina and then from there to aluminum. Okay. This process, one, two, three, can create 100,000 jobs in one plant or two plants. And I'll tell you why. Because this, this plant, they are robots. They work 24 hours meaning that people will start working eight-hour shifts. So you agree to the 24-hour um, agree policy? To, I don't agree to any 24-hour policy. I agree to a 24-hour shift if you have industrial power. Okay. I don't know any 24-hour policy you're talking about, but what I'm saying... What I'm talking it, about, I'm referencing what former President John Romani Mama what did, said. What did he say? That How do you understand what well, he, he said? Well, he says that we're going to ensure that the economy runs 24 hours. And so how, 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 did, how did you understand that? You well, are that, saying that it. means that, I mean, just like we have in New York and the other places, yes. we're going to have businesses run 24 hours. How so you don't you have to, to wait till morning before how, you can go and even apply How for are you passport. going to let... That is what you are saying something mm -hmm. and you're trying to refer me to him. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that if somebody says something, they have to have an explanation. Okay. How that 24 hour is going to, I'm giving you how 24 hour shift work is okay. going to happen. This, it, it happens through industrialization because it's a machine that is working 24 hours. Mm. If he said that, it's different. He okay. did not say that. So I'm not referring to what he's saying. Okay. And I think that you have understood what he's saying without knowing how it's going to be no, done. No, no, you, you, you can't judge just because you're Oh, because saying I thought that's what you were asking, saying. No, oh, I was so, just oh, asking. No, I was just you're taking your words back. Are you, no, I'm not taking it back. I'm okay. just asking you that. Are you referencing what the former president oh, oh, had no, also said? Oh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be okay. here saying what I don't know. Okay. I'm only talking about what I understand, you know, and what I know is best mm. in terms of industrialization because 
if people work from eight to six and there's another person coming to take over the shift from mm. eight to 12 and 12 to eight and it's going on and on. Then For me, see. my interest is the three ways of creating jobs. Okay. And so if the workers are 10,000 uh, by eight to six, uh, you have another 10,000 coming in mm -hmm. after and after. So instead of creating 10,000 jobs, now it's 30,000 jobs. Okay. And I think this happens everywhere in the world that is well developed. You know, they have their industrial areas and, you know, they create a lot of things and they sell to the world. Okay. Let, let's go back to the issue about, you know, dredging the sea into the other river bodies. Now, I'm monitoring some comments and there's one who's saying that, but some of these water bodies serve as, you know, um, drinking water for some communities, etc. Now, if you're trying to connect the sea to some of these bodies, of course, we know that the issue of salination also comes up. Absolutely. And that affects the livelihood of the animals that also no, drink from these water all. bodies. Okay, so can all. you explain that? Then? Because first of all, what canals do a lot of things. There's irrigation system that mm -hmm. comes out of it, so it helps farming. Okay, there is purification system that can come out of it, so okay. it helps the nation. Because once you industrialize the connection, then you can do a lot of things with it. It's like industrializing cocoa mm -hmm. and then making sure that the manufacturing processes become three or four. We're going to find what to do with the after the waste mm -hmm. of it, you know, and do different things with it. So it's the same thing that is going to happen with our water bodies when it's connected. Because at the moment, we are throwing things into it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's deserted. It's left. It's not being used. It's not being run. People are not sailing through it. People are not driving through it. You know, it's like a road. If there are portals and the, the road is busy, you have to fix it. Mm -hmm. You have to cover the portals mm -hmm. because the road is busy. It's the same thing with water. Once they start to use it, they service it. Okay. Okay. And I think we are running from industrialization as a country. We are running from it. This is the only thing that will save our economy. Once we connect this, I mean, look at the difference that it will make. If Pra mm -hmm. and Oti is connected, and then some sea from Second D is pushing the water towards Kumasi, and now Kumasi can have a vessel mm -hmm. with 100 containers if they have to deliver something. C can we see the map again? Yeah. Um, just so we, we have a better understanding for those of you who have just tuned in. So if you look at Kumasi, mm -hmm. I mean, the water bodies, mm -hmm. It goes all the way to Afram. Mm -hmm. But that means you're going to have to bring it some way, somehow, into Kumasi itself, which is what you had mentioned earlier, It's right? just connecting the waters. Look, my point is very simple, mm -hmm. Bella. We have all these water bodies in this country. Mm -hmm. Not one of them have we connected. There is no water transportation in this country. I can give you a perfect example in Ada. The water is meeting the sea right in your face. Mm. Now, this water goes maybe 100 kilometers further. If there was any pot right there in between the water and the sea, you have a huge power of transportation. That is, if that on that water lane there is gold, there is oil, mm -hmm. that you can now start transporting it. But what it has become is become a residential use. You know, so yeah. there's no commercial or there's no industrial use for it. You know, there could be fishes, that could be our fishing area. Mm -hmm. So we don't import fishes anymore because now we industrialize the water yeah. and there are lots of things going on. But today you see a few houses along the way and people just maybe cruising one or two boats on there. Yeah. But I'm just saying that it meets the water. So there so are a lot of rivers in Ghana that is meeting. But it's going sea. to pass through land. And that means having to break down some buildings? Because there if you look be, at Kumasi, there, for there could example. be settlement. There is nothing wrong with regentrification. Re okay. Gentrification, it's a must when you are developing a country. Mm. You need to regentrify some things. I mean, you're looking at a place like Nima in Accra. Mm -hmm. That is billions of dollars of development if we have to do a resettlement for them. Okay. That is by building a new community for the people in Nima and slowly developing that space in faces. You know, they do it in England, they do it in America. You go to somewhere like Hackney and then you come back eight years, they've done the Olympics in that area, mm. they've developed the place. One apartment is now 300,000 when the apartment used to be 50,000, yeah. you know. So uh, definitely there will be settlement, you know. Okay. And, and it, it is very possible because it could be settlement for just like maybe 10 people, but the development would benefit millions people. of people. Have, have we put a cost to this? 
Um, I wouldn't really want to talk about numbers because when you're not ready, it's like you have a vision. You know, you need action. If you don't have the action, then the vision is a mere. So you're dream. not ready at the moment. I what mean, I, I don't. I, even... What I mean at the moment is, I mean, before you announce something like this, you'd expect that maybe there's a plan. Oh, I, 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 I know. I, been conducted, I know. So there's I, some I know what to, to do to do it. Okay. But I'm saying that. It, it would take me to be in power to do so. I cannot go to a country and I start connecting that. the world. But what? even before you make some promises, for example, um, you know, let's say Free SHS, for example, before the president may have announced it, maybe he had a feasibility studies conducted, which is why we're asking, because at this point, you should be able to tell us that looking at how to connect these river bodies to the sea, et cetera, it might cost us ABC. It's not a promise, okay. my dear. It's a purpose. It's a vision. I am saying that it is possible. Okay. I, I can do it by bringing the right professionals that understand dredging, mm. mapping, you know, defending, okay. you know, because you need to create sea defenses, a lot of things. Yeah. And then let the water flow. Then after that, you need to now create the coastal or the water transportation. That's another whole thing. So it's a process of things. It's not a project that would be a one-year project. Of course. You know, it, 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 once I'm able to do one, and two, the other leaders would see that it has changed the economy and has brought speed into our logistic logistical path. Mm. And everybody will be interested to do so. For example, I mean, when you look on the map, you will see Volta Lake. Mm -hmm. It's a man-made lake, and it's one of the biggest. I mean, in fact, it's so big in a country. What are they using it for? People are just doing, you know, little fishing stuff in there. You mm. know, we haven't connected the lake to anything. Look at it. It's connected to a farm. You know, it can go all the way, see how close it is to, okay. to Kumase, you know. So there are things that can happen in Kumase and we can transport it on the water to Volta, to Kuforidia, to right. a lot of places. So we're still waiting for the feasibility studies because, again, when it comes to Ghanaians... I, I don't need to show Ghanaians feasibility studies when they cannot do anything about it, okay? First of all, Ghanaians have money, but they might not know how to use it. Okay. They only borrow money to pay debts and to do roads to create contracts, okay? Money needs to be invested and yeah. there has to be returns. And so I believe that the government is supposed to have some kind of partnership with the private sector exactly. and not turn the private sector to contractors because the private sectors in this country are contractors. But they're the ones who need their study, which is why I'm asking Sorry, for it. Who, who, who so the feasibility study? study that I'm talking about is not for every Ghanaian necessarily. Who would need the study? Of course, the stakeholders who are supposed to conduct this exercise. Uh -huh. So let's say the contractors in the country, of course, you would want their buy-in on this you cannot on your own as a president decide that no, you're going I, to that is not this. what i'm saying look if we as a nation believe that we have to fix our road we don't need going to ask people permission that study the feasibility of this before i do the road okay mm -hmm. the cost of a road when you bring foreigners to do it is one million dollars a kilometer yeah that is the price it's the same thing when you're building a house. Yeah. It's two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars per square meter. Okay. When you're dredging, it's gonna come with the price. Mm. It could be five thousand. It could be ten thousand per uh, a million meter, mm. whatever it is. Mm. And then you have to see that okay, I'm gonna go at one hundred and forty-eight kilometers or two hundred kilometers and this and see defense. So okay. all of these things will come from like the design of it, the engineering of it. That's how you get the costing. Okay. But the idea now is there, and I want Ghanaians to understand that it is feasible. It is possible. It's possible. It can happen, and it's happening in a lot of countries, yeah. and they're benefiting from it. Apart from everything I've said, with irrigation, with industrialization, with purification, all the shins, shin, shins, mm. you also have tourism. Yeah. where people will be sailing on your water and they're going to see parts of Ghana that you and I have never seen. Good, beautiful landscaping and all of that that we have deserted for a long time. So it, it, there are a lot of great opportunities with such an idea. And it, it just, the, the, the media also sometimes, you know, they like a headline that would be so controversial and, you know, it's like, you know, get people to bash you no, a little bit. No, no, it's no, nice. Not I necessarily. Mean, I mean... I, I, I think so far what has gone around is what you have said, which is why we're also now borrowing in, into it. But in terms of priority, would you say this is priority? I've listened to Ghanaian say that we lack adequate hospitals. Our hospitals are not even equipped um, to global standards. Our education is also in shambles. We have students who are learning under trees. Jobs, which you have said already, that's also another major problem. Our roads are bad. We're even grappling with developing our railway system. So these are things that are low-hanging fruits that we should tackle before even coming up with ideas such as this.
So for you, what is your priority? Well, first of all, my priority is industrialization. You see, I don't see why you're going to build a hospital first without thinking of the factories that will give the people the jobs, that will give them the average salary that will make them be able to afford for the hospital bill. Mm. Okay, that's the mistake we're doing. We go and build like low-income housing, 1,500 homes in a place, and then we don't put a factory there. We don't put places that the people who are living in the low-income housing can just walk to work. Mm -hmm. But they go and live there, and they have to take a car 22 kilometers away from where they live. And they spend an hour and a half to two hours on a small single road. Mm. So in a day, they travel 44 kilometers and they lose four hours of their time. Yeah. Okay. Now, this guy, within eight years, he would have spent the money that he bought the low-income house with on transportation mm. and on time. More than that, yeah. he would have lost already. So we need the first important in, uh, integrations first. And it would automatically attract these things. You see, when people are going to, if I'm going to build a university in, let's say, Takrade, mm -hmm. I have to know that, first of all, they're like 500,000 workers, you know, and I have to study their, their returns, their average salary. And then I have to be able to tell that, okay, there is like a billion dollars mm. circulating in this four kilometer square or this five kilometer square and the demand for hospital or yeah. university is there. So then my returns of my investment is guaranteed. But okay. if I have to go and put a hospital there and people are begging and they bring them and they're dying and they don't have money, the business cannot work, mm. which is what is happening in Ghana now. People are going to Kolebu, they're dying, they don't have the money because they, they, they take 1,000 or 2,000 CDs a month. And then out of that, their taxes, uh, snakes, so many things out of it. And then they have to pay their wife. They have to take care of four children. They mm. have to pay their fees. These guys said, they, look, we're in trouble as a country. And I think it's because we're running away from the fact that we are not industrialized. Okay. We need to let whatever returns that is coming from the resources that we have mm. circulate in our system and not go out of the system. Okay. So that means that we don't need a national cathedral. We need factories. I, well, I would invest for me. I would invest in industrial first before I would think of commercial. Okay. Okay. Commercial without industrial, it's a problem. Okay. You know, that's what I think. We have to go, unfortunately, our time is up. But quickly, I just want to find out. I remember that uh, just when you had announced your bid to become president, the GRA had mentioned that you owe some 7 million Ghana cities. Have you been able to sort that out? I don't think um, the GRA said it because I was reading it. Mm. They, they were saying that. Uh, uh, someone that is investigating things that some, sometime in 2013 mm. I did not make some payments mm. and all of that. But I think it's just a basic political propaganda. I'm used to it now, you know, because, you, you, you know, before my announcement, there was a convention, there's been cancellations, there's been TV days, is that even on our tour, mm. you know, there is appointments and places that have been booked and then they, they come and say, yeah, cancel it, take this and remove it. It's all, you know, I mean... The point I'm trying to make here is that the average Ghanaian is suffering. Mm. You know, I might be a young, successful man, mm. but it's not fun because there is so much that I'm paying, you know, from EPA to taxes to SNIT to that, and mm. yet we still have problems uh, with it. I mean, if you look today, I don't think we have a Ghanaian-owned bank. Yeah. I don't think we have great entrepreneurs in this country. Nigerians have done well. They've created more than a few billionaires, and it helps their economy. Uh, Ghanaians have sucked in more than a few mm. billionaires, mm. and it's caved in the economy. So I think positively, I think that, you know, sometimes we need to use the negative things in our lives, in our economy, to build up something, something. to change all of that. Well, you know. I, I also did see um, a news article indicating that your former spokesperson, who was deported from the country, has indicated that she's going to court um, to argue out how she was treated. Yeah, I think, I think they, they've taken Ghana to court. Uh, it's in ECOWAS. ECOWAS there, court. There, okay. Yeah, there's been a lot that has happened. And, and I think that she wasn't fairly treated. I also think that Ghanaians misunderstood the fact that I didn't have a registered political party. I mm. only had a movement, and it's a guaranteed company, and therefore I'm allowed to use 
anyone to be my spokesperson. Mm. And I don't see a problem either hiring a Ghanaian or hiring an outsider to do the job. You know, it's uh, finding someone as a spokesperson. Of course, I gave some opportunities to local people to be a part of it. But truly, the main problem in this country is fear. And the country is divided into two, who mm. joins one party or who joins the other. And, you know, I don't want to go through all of that stuff, you know, okay. it's a waste of time. So. Well, well, we'll see how that goes. But where next are you going? Well, um, I'm going to Volta region. Okay. Uh, I stopped two days, you know, to get a break. And then from there, I go to Eastern region. I'll be going to Koforidia. I'll be going to Nkoko. Mm. And then I'll go to Kau. I see. And, um, yeah, after we come back and, and we go away for a month and prepare for the main campaign. Wow, well, we're looking forward to it. And that's when you'll be visiting all the constituencies and the districts. Everywhere. I'll be visiting the nation. We're looking oh. forward to that. But thank but you. thank you so much for joining us this morning, throwing thank some you light very much. on that statement that you made. And, of course, congratulations as well because I know that the girl so um, Hene had also oh yeah it's yeah. giving me the war tar, you know like it's time it's time to lose in the armors of of people and um, I know God is going to subdue nations because it has to be so mm. uh, Africa Africa needs leadership and the leadership should be young people. You've seen what is happening in Senegal. Mm. You've seen what is happening in Burkina. It's a revolution I happening. I mean, there's a 44-year-old who is yeah. leading the polls in Senegal. Does yeah. that give you hope that there's a wind of change that's blowing across the continent? I mean, they, 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 they have to put him in jail. They have to, mm. you know, it's, this, it's stressful that I think we Africans, our fathers should embrace us. Mm. They should let us inherit or, or, or possess whatever they have and not wait for them to die before we look for a way to become like them or correct the mistakes in the past. Mm. You know, I think the time has come that the youth, the mindset of the young people, the fresh blood of the young people should also become a part of the contribution in terms of our social, national, continental yeah. development. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anakwa Mbidiaku, for speaking to us. Freedom Jacob Caesar is what some people call him, and you call him probably Cheddar. But whichever way, um, very likely he is going to be on the ballot paper come uh, December 7, 2024, hoping to get your votes to become president of this nation. It's really up to you and whether you buy into his policies so far. But it's been a pleasure speaking to thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll do a part two of this. For those who are saying the time was too short, don't worry. There'll be more time for more yeah, conversations. I mean, you owe me uh, an interview there on a, on a on dog the walk. Yeah, on yeah. a dog walk. Yes, we have to do that as well. So yeah. we'll make that happen. Then we can have Definitely. enough time. Definitely. All right. Thank you Thank so much. You. And yes, we have one more conversation coming up on TV3 New Day. Don't go anywhere.